a while. And so starting off, uh, as you know, my lab's place in the world of CH functionalization is in radical chemistry. And so if I were to play a, a mind association game, I ask you about radicals. Some of you might think of the de deleterious biological effects. Um, some of you might be thinking more chemically, uh, the sort of slow ways. Uh, oh, I see. The slides are coming in a little bit slowly. So, so some of the, the old fashioned ways of making radicals, but in the 21st century, uh, a lot of the, the methods of making radicals now are much milder. And so if you were to describe our lab essentially in this one sentence, it's that we take advantage of these milder methods of accessing radicals to harness their selective reactivity. And so if I say selective reactivity, selective reactivity of radicals, some of you might think, wait a minute, radicals are not selective. But in fact, I urge you to re remember that the very first radical reaction many of us learn is actually the anti-Markovnikov selective uh, hydrobromination reaction uh, ver by virtue of radicals. And so uh, in, in a nutshell, the two major programs in my lab are actually this type of polarity reversal as well as a selective hydrogen atom abstraction. And I'm going to be talking about the second program. Uh, for for today, and so one of the one of the problems that we're working on that probably needs uh, no introduction to this group is we were interested in the regio selective CH functionalization of various positions on a ubiquitous functional group such as an alcohol. I show here some examples of some of our favorite alcohols, and really getting right into the secret sauce, the the method by which we we introduce. Uh, CH functionalization is by appending a nitrogen-centered radical onto a so-called radical chaperone that via a radical relay introduces selective uh, carbon radical formation on that chain. And really a lot of the theory behind this idea we recently reviewed in this review that I've listed at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is actually the very first paper that all new members in the group read. And so if you're new to the field, I urge you to take a look at this uh, pedagogically really great review. If you do take a look at it, what you'll see is two of our favorite reactions listed here, the hoffman leffler freitag reaction, where a halo amine is converted to its distal halide uh, via this radical pathway. Of course, the conditions are a century old. They involve neat sulfuric acid, UV light, and a basic workup that converts it uh, to a pyrrolidine. But the selectivity here is robust. and so. Every organic chemist thinks of six-membered transition states, and here's an entropically and enthalpically favored 1,5-hydrogen atom transfer through uh, just that very thing. And below I have the Barton reaction uh, via a similar transition state using an oxygen-centered radical. And so just looking at the nitrogen-centered variant, if you were to go and conduct this reaction today, which I believe uh, one of our upcoming speakers is going to show you some nice natural product synthesis, Using the Suarez modification, what you'd likely use is iodine and hypervalent iodine in this cocktail to generate a weak Ni bond in situ, which you can now homolyze with just visible light to make the N-centered radical. Um, and then eventual formation of the carbon iodine uh, delta to the amine, and then displacement of that weak bond is going to give you a pyrrolidine. So that's the first gray box. At the bottom of the screen, there's another gray box uh, which is thought to explain how the two iodine reagents combine to form a hypoiodate and in a two electron pathway uh, generates the Ni bond. Of course, you don't need light for the bottom gray box, uh, but one of the beauties of this reaction is that you can put all the reagents together and shine the visible light at it. The only issue is uh, those of you who've played with iodine or hypoiodate know that you usually tend to not shine light at it they can do promiscuous reactions. And so the dirty little secret really is that the reaction I have shown at the top of the screen with a secondary unbiased CH uh, does not in fact work. If you look back at the original Suarez uh, reactions, you'll find that this chemistry was really beautiful in the, in the synthesis of steroid derivatives or, or other sugar molecules like this one uh, bearing weak CH bonds. The state of the art is really chemistry pioneered by Gonzalez and Herrera. Uh, this sort of portion-wise iodine addition as, as one solution uh, to this iodine problem, or Munez's nice catalytic solution to the iodine problem. And so ours was a complementary solution. We thought if we could simply make iodine in situ from a cheap sodium iodide source, 
Uh, one advantage might be, and this is borrowing from the, the battery uh, redox chemistry world, is that excess iodide might be able to slowly uh, scoop up the excess iodine as triiodide. And so we essentially would have a syringe pump uh, forming triiodide, having triiodide and iodide form iodine slowly over time. And of course, I wouldn't tell you about this unless it worked. And this is work by Ethan Wappas and Stacey Fosu, who were two of my first graduate students who, who showed that you don't even need to add iodine as you dose in a little bit more sodium iodide. You can essentially solve this secondary CH amination for the first time. And I think a picture is worth a thousand words here. So in green is the NMR of the pure product with the diagnostic three alpha nitrogen protons. In blue is the crude NMR of Ethan and Stacy's reaction where you see essentially just product. And in red, uh, those are the former conditions. Let's just say they work somewhat, but they also do a, a whole lot of other uh, radical decomposition pathways. And so uh, this, this chemistry is, is broadly uh, useful. So uh, on this slide, we have demonstrated the CH functionalization of secondary CH bonds on the right, uh, tolerating a, a variety of functional groups on the left-hand side. Um, and, and my understanding is that there are at least uh, two companies uh, in the medicinal chemistry uh, realm who've been using this as a unique method of, of synthesizing pyrrolidines from secondary CH bonds. So really the premise of this chemistry uh, uh, the hypothesis originally was that triiodide would be a great uh, syringe pup for iodine, and so we, we wanted to test whether or not this was in fact the case. So uh, using UV vis spectroscopy as one tool, uh, we find iodine here at the bottom in purple, uh, triiodide in gray above it, and under our reaction conditions, we see these diagnostic triiodide peaks, uh, leading us to believe that triiodide is in fact a key uh, to solving this problem. Another interesting mechanistic application is that sodium iodide is cheap and also uh, easily changed to sodium bromide. And when we do this, we can actually intercept the intermediate before the, the last on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, and that's a delta bromide. Uh, or if we swapped it out for a sodium chloride, we can even trap the intermediate at the bottom left of the screen, uh, that uh, N-chloro bond in, in a mild fashion. And so with this nitrogen-centered chemistry uh, behind us, we wanted to tackle the real challenge we were looking to set out to, and, and specifically the alcohol-based challenge. And this is work uh, pioneered by Ethan Wapis and Koki Nakafuku. And here the, the chaperone strategy was simply, can we append a nitrogen-centered radical onto a ubiquitous alcohol motif and then direct selective CH functionalization? And so uh, the, the chemistry of directing groups appended to alcohols is certainly rich. Uh, those in the, uh, especially in this center and around the world, in the metal-mediated CH functionalization community, have certainly uh, developed this area. Um, and as you can imagine, the, the radicals uh, community has also been thinking about it even back from the early days of Breslow, uh, with more recent contributions also uh, highlighted here. So we thought uh, to tackle this problem, we could start off with what we thought was a simple extension, uh, taking these aldehyde-derived amines, making hemiaminals, and then affecting a simple proof of concept CH amination. Um, I use the word simple uh, loosely. Uh, essentially, this slide shows uh, over a year's worth of work where we essentially could never affect that delta CH amination on these hemiaminals and exclusively always observed this beta scission imidate product. And so in the gray box on the top right here, I have shown essentially what we kept convincing ourselves was a two electron mechanism for this decomposition pathway. So we said to ourselves, well, if we could simply get to an exclusive one electron uh, mechanism, then surely we would not get this imidate formation. So we uh, pre-generated the N-chloro subjected to visible light. And sure enough, we actually improved the beta scission pathway. And again, you can draw one electron arrows to, to give that same imidate formation. And really, no matter how many ways we tried to over-engineer this system, uh, you know, tert butyls are good leaving groups. Perhaps even a methyl, as you see all the way to the right, would be a terrible leaving group. Um, we certainly don't think we're generating methyl radicals, but uh, needless to say, we always observe beta scission products, uh, no matter how we tried to, to engineer our way out of, out of this problem. So deciding to go back and hit the drawing board, uh, just a summary of where we were at, the, at this time, we knew that these hemiaminals were exceedingly prone to beta scission. 
Um, but we also knew that we could uh, obtain these imidates in pretty high yields at the end of the reaction. And so we knew they're stable to radicals. And, and sort of the big leap of thought here was, could we make radicals on imidates and perhaps after hydrogen atom transfer, get to a, a stable imidate? Of course, not a lot is really known about imidate radical chemistry, um, sp2 nitrogen centers in general. Uh, this is essentially all we saw uh, in the literature was this nice work by Newcomb on these cyclization studies comparing sp3 to sp2 nitrogens. I won't really belabor the point because these are cyclization reactions, except to say that they react differently, and that was exciting enough for us. Uh, it looks like we weren't the only ones thinking about these problems around the same time. Uh, this imine radical shown here on the bottom uh, has been looked at by Chiba, Novato, Leonori, uh, and Studer. But the imidate radical, the only singular example we could find was in Australia, uh, shown here the cyclization, uh, which was done by uh, Glover in a more uh, physical organic sense, where they did EPR to prove that a nitrogen-centered radical exists and that it cyclizes. Um, and, and we thought that was interesting because imidates are, are quite common. Many of you tend to think about how easy they are to synthesize, to use for the Overman rearrangement. Uh, we've been really fascinated thinking about the Overman rearrangement and even looking at this 2009 uh, uh, first person account by Overman about how the discovery went. And I absolutely love the story that it was a serendipitous discovery with the hopes of forming this hydroemination product in the gray box here. Well. It turns out, uh, lucky, I guess, for our whole community that Overman instead discovered the rearrangement. And uh, just as an aside, I guess 44 years later, our group has recently shown that radicals actually give that hydroemination product, but that's a story for uh, another day. The story I wanted to show you was that upon pinner combination of acetonitrile and this alcohol, we could access an imidate, subjecting it to these conditions for the first time we observed that uh, CN bond formation, selective at the beta position. After an acidic workup, uh, we now uh, expose a basic amine that under simple acid-base extraction allows you to get to the beta amino alcohol, essentially in one afternoon from an alcohol to this beta amino alcohol in a chromatography-free uh, fashion. Of course, we were very excited to get this CN formation, but we weren't ready to celebrate just yet. We thought we could improve it a little more and, and in order to do this, what we did was we, we went back and thought about what we already knew about sp3 nitrogen-centered radicals. That is to say that the protecting group vastly affects the electronics and the reactivity. And we could essentially show this by calculating the SOMO energies, showing you uh, triflamids are much more reactive than tazamids. And although there are no protecting groups on this uh, imidate radical, uh, what we were happy to see is that the modular backbone of the imidate, which you get to just by varying the nitrile that condenses onto the alcohol, could give that same range of SOMO energy. And so moving to the trichloroimidate used in the Overman rearrangement under these radical conditions, this is uh, really insane to me. On the very first try, Ethan and Koki observed quantitative and uh, selective beta amination. Uh, again, giving us the chromatography-free version shown in green. And so just to highlight some of the applications of this chemistry, uh, at least for all of these allylic and benzylic CH bonds, their activity was exquisite, as well as the diastereic selectivity, as I have shown here at the bottom. Uh, and we rationalized that uh, simply as uh, forming that oxazolin ring uh, is preferred uh, from one face. And so what we were surprised by is that we could not extend this chemistry to the unbiased CHs. Um, we had done uh, kinetic isotope uh, effect studies and found that the hydrogen atom transfer is indeed rate limiting. Uh, but instead, we isolate only this iodide intermediate, a never cyclization. So we thought to ourselves, this is really just a two electron problem. If we just change that nucleophile to be a little more electron releasing, like in a benzimidate, uh, we could instead get uh, amination of simple unbiased CH bonds, and sure enough, uh, that is what we observed. And so we were able to take this benzimidate uh, strategy and apply it to a variety of primary and secondary alcohols. We think there's a slight change in mechanism, as you can see here. Uh, we observe great diastereo selectivity only in cases of cyclic alcohols this time, uh, not the acyclic ones. And so 
Uh, we believe that that sort of is indicative uh, of a change of, of mechanism for that final displacement. And again, at the bottom right of the screen, you can see when we start with an enangio pure starting material, we get 100% stereoablation, again, showing uh, uh, the loss of stereochemical information uh, down there. And so we had shown uh, acidic hydrolysis gets to the beta amine, but of course you take these oxazolins and hydrolyze them with a variety of uh, nucleophiles. And in this box on the right, we show some of those nucleophiles. Um, and then funny enough, just trying to fill space on this slide, we thought to ourselves, what else can an oxazolin uh, do? And, and so we knew we could oxi oxidize it to an oxazole. It uh, turns out this is actually one of the more interesting applications in the medicinal chemistry realm. Um, and, and this slide here kind of shows why that is. Nitro oils and alcohols are two modular small uh, components that you can stick together to make an imidate. And under two consecutive oxidations, we get to an important heteroaromatic core. So that was simply our first generation. We thought we could do better. And what I have shown here was our second generation was simply a one pot experiment without purifying the oxazolin, that worked. And then funny enough, when we really tried to push it, we looked at these two oxidation steps and thought if we could combine them, um, and, and sure enough, we could, uh, then we could affect a cascade reaction straight from the imidate all the way up to the uh, oxazole. Uh, further development of this chemistry is by Leah Stateman, uh, who's been doing uh, some great mechanistic work, uh, just showing you the catalytic uh, version of the reaction that she's developed here on the bottom left. You can see some of the kinetics where this reaction is done essentially in half an hour now. Um, but what I wanted to show you was one last story where we wanted to trap this nitrogen centered radical with something besides a CN bond. And this is work by Dr. Avaseya Vinitcha and Ethan Wapis. Uh, and it really, it came out of thinking a lot about this system and how we break the NI bond and that I radical is still hanging around. And so Looking at the pathway on the bottom left here, we thought a simple radical trap like an acrylate uh, should be able to generate CC bond formation. To our surprise, however, uh, even in neat acrylate, a solvent, uh, we could never generate that CC bond. We, what we always thought we observed was CI bond formation, albeit it wasn't isolable in the secondary case. So if you look back in the benzylic case with the trichloroimidates, uh, we get benzylic amination in the tertiary CH case. Uh, we instead were able to isolate that uh, carbon iodine bond, but we always just observed decomposition for secondary CH bonds. And so the way we rationalized this was this iodine is also prone to oxidation to generate a hypervalent iodine. Of course, these are known to be fantastic leaving groups, something on the order of millions of times better leaving group than a triflate. And so we thought perhaps this oxidation, if we can't beat it, we can outcompete it with a nitrogen centered oxidation. And so at the top of this slide here, I have the, the new hypothesis we imagined, uh, oxidation, first of that nitrogen, and then HAT of uh, a weak CH bond to generate a CI bond. If you were to repeat that hydrogen atom transfer in an iterative sense, now the, the next CH bond next to the halogen is actually two kcals weaker. We imagined we could again abstract that and access these beta geminal diiodides. And so, a real underlying philosophy in my group is that we're pursuing radical chemistry because of its complementarity uh, to metal mediated CH functionalization. And so in the gray box at the bottom here, I have work from the, the center. Um, specifically, the only other beta iodides we've seen in the literature, there are three of them and two of them actually come from Jin Kwan Yu's lab. And I, I highlight this really just to show the complementarity here so that in the palladium mediated system, it favors primary CH bonds, generates a mono iodide. And if you really push the system, as you see on the bottom right, it again generates a mono iodide at a different carbon complementary to this radical pathway. And so uh, with that in mind, we decided to pursue both the mono and the dihalogenation, really focusing on that geminal uh, beta dihalogenation. On the bottom here, I show all the various uh, halogens, iodine, bromine, and chlorine that work as well as a fuller scope of the iodine. Here's just a brief look at the kinetics uh, where we observe the mono iodide uh, transient intermediate in red here after just a couple of minutes and eventually it converts very quickly. Um, our rate studies have shown that actually the second CH functionalization it goes twice as fast. And then just to end here on a fun competition, we were curious about the different reactivities 
of different halides, and so we just mixed the sodium iodide and sodium bromide, and we observed actually a statistical mixture uh, of those different mixed halide systems. However, with the chloride, we had observed that it required UV light to break that NCL bond. And so under UV light, we exclusively get chlorination, presumably decomposing the iodide. But under visible light, uh, we observe uh, the iodination, really just going to say that uh, the reactivity is different. But what we thought we could do is synthetically take advantage of that reactivity by first doing a monochlorination and then a selective beta uh, iodination of that same carbon generating the mixed halide system. And then just a last chemistry slide here, just showing a, a somewhat complex molecule where we took an alcohol, converted it to the imidate, and then took that diiodide product and, and hydrolyzed it. Uh, I thought this was interesting in showing that those diiodides, although you don't see a lot of these aliphatic geminal diiodides in the literature, they're much more stable than one would expect. And so uh, uh, silver and zinc are, are ways to oxidize or, uh, excuse me, uh, hydrolyze or, or reduce them. And so just to summarize what I've shown you today, uh, the two stories are the CH functionalization at the delta position of amines and trapping the corresponding intermediates, as well as the beta selective functionalizations of alcohols via these imidate radicals to, to access a family uh, of products. And just to end it here, I'd, I'd like to just show pretty pictures of Columbus, uh, the capital of Ohio, um, as well as pretty pictures uh, around our new laboratory. Uh, as you can see at the very bottom of the screen, we're getting our 12th uh, new NMR uh, sometime in the next month or so, and so it's a fantastic place uh, to do chemistry. I encourage you to visit uh, if, if you're ever in central Ohio. And then last but not least, uh, the most important slide is to thank my fantastic group here. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're vibrant. Uh, it's always fun to talk chemistry with them, and they've really driven a lot of this chemistry, and so I, I certainly thank them. Uh, they're listening uh, just next door to this talk. Uh, I thank these funding agencies. Again, I thank the center and uh, happy to take any questions.